Heidi by Ivana Spiri and narration by Tanvi Gupta. Chapter 1 Heidi's First Mountain Climb On a bright June morning, two figures, one a tall girl and the other a child, could be seen climbing a narrow mountain path that winds up from the pretty village of Minecraft to the lofty heights of the Palm Mountain. In spite of the hot June sun, a child was clothed as if to keep off the bitterest frost. She did not look more than five years old, but what her natural figure was, like would be hard to say. For she had on apparently two dresses, one above the other, and over these a thick red wooden shawl. Her small feet were shod in thick nailed mountain shoes. When the wayfarers came to the hamlet known as Geoffrey, which is situated halfway up the mountain, they met with greetings from all sides. For the elder girl was now in her pool. As they were leaving the village, a voice called out. Wait a moment, Dete. If you are going up on the mountain, I will come along with you. The girl thus addressed Susan, and the child immediately let go her hand and seated herself on the ground. Are you tired, Heidi? asked the companion. No, I'm not answered the child. We shall soon get to the top now. You must walk bravely on a little longer and take good long steps. In another hour we shall be there, said Dante. They were now joined by a stout, good-natured looking woman who walked on ahead with her old acquaintance. And where are you going with the child? As the one who had just joined the party. I suppose it is a child your sister left. Yes, answered it. I am taking her up to uncle, where she must stay. This child, stay up there with our uncle. You must be out of your senses, Dede. How can you think of such a thing? The old man, however, will soon send you both packing off home again. Not very well do that, seeing that he is her grandfather. You must do something for her. I've had the charge of the child till now. And I can tell you, Barbell, I am not going to give up the chance which has just fallen to me of getting a good place for her sake. That would be all very well if we were like other people, said Barbell. But you know what he is and what he can do with a child, especially with one so young. The child cannot possibly live with her. But where are you thinking of going yourself? To Frankfurt, where an extra good place awaits me, answered Dete. I am glad I'm not the child, exclaimed Barbara. Not a creature knows anything about the old man up there. He will have nothing to do with anybody and never sets his foot inside a church from one year's end to another. When he does come down once in a while, everybody clears out of his way. The mere sight of him with his bushy grey eyebrows and immense beard is alarming enough. All kind of things are said about him. You Dete, however, must certainly have learnt a good deal concerning him from his sister. Yes, but I'm not going to repeat what I heard. Suppose it should come to hear this. I should get into no end of trouble about it. Barbara put her arm through Dete's in a confidential sort of way and said, Now don't tell me what is wrong with the old man. Was he always shunned as he is now? And was he always so cross? I assure you, I will hold my tongue if you tell me. Very well then, I will tell you. But just wait a moment, said Dick. 
walking around the Heidi who had slipped away unnoticed. I see where she is, exclaimed Margaret. Look over there. And she pointed to a spot far away from the footpath. She's climbing up the slope beyond her with Peter and his boats. But tell me about the old man. Did he ever have anything more than his two boats and his hut? I should think so indeed, replied Dete with animation. He was at one time the owner of one of the largest farms in Bolmesh, where my mother used to live. But he drank and gambled away the whole of his property. And when he this became known to his mother and father, he died of sorrow, one shortly after the other. Uncle, having nothing left to him but his bad name, disappeared and it was hard that he had to go to Minneapolis as a soldier. After 12 or 15 years, he reappeared in Burbage, bringing with him a young son whom he tried to place with some of his kinspeople. Every door, however, was shut in his face, for no one wished to have any more to do with him. Embittered by this treatment, he vowed never to set foot in Burbage again. And he then came to Geoffrey while he lived with his little boy. His wife, it seemed, had died shortly after the child's birth. He must have accumulated some money during his absence, for he apprenticed his son Tobias to a carpenter. He was a steady lad and kindly received by everyone in the office. His father, however, was still looked upon with suspicion and it was even rumoured that he had killed a man in some brawl at Naples. But why does everybody call him uncle? Surely he can't be uncle to everyone living in your family, asked Barbara. Our grandmothers were related, so we used to call him uncle. And as my father had family connections with so many people in your family, soon everyone fell into the habit of calling him uncle, explained Tete. And what happened to Tobias? Further questioned Barbell, who was listening with deep interest. Tobias was taught his trade in Nels, and when he had served his apprenticeship, he came back to Geoffrey and married my sister Ladelite. But their happiness did not last long. Two years after their marriage, Tobias was killed in an accident. His wife was so overcome with grief that she fell into a fever from which she never recovered. She had always been rather delicate and subject to curious attacks during which no one knew whether she was awake or sleeping. And so two months after Tobias had been carried to the grave, his wife followed him. Their sad fate was the talk of everybody far and near and the general opinion was expressed that it was punishment which uncle deserved for the godless life he had done. Our minister endeavoured to awaken his conscience. The old man grew only more wrathful and stubborn and would not speak to a soul. All at once we heard that he had gone to live up upon the arm mountain and that he did not intend to come down again. Since then he had led his solitary life up there. And everyone knows him by now by the name of Papa. Mother and I took Adelaide's little one, only then only a year old, into our care. My mother died last year, and I went down to the baths to earn some money. I paid old Purcell to take care of her. So you see, I have done my duty. Now it's Uncle's turn. But where are you going to yourself, Barbara? We are now halfway up the arm. We've just reached the place I wanted, answered Father. I must see Peter's mother, who is doing some spinning for me. So goodbye, Dede, and good luck to you. She went to her a small dark brown hut, which stood a step away from the path in a hollow that afforded it some protection from the mountain wind. Here lived Peter, the 11-year-old boy, with his mother, Brigitta, and his blind grandmother, who was known to all the old and young in the neighborhood as just grandmother. 
Every morning, Peter went down to Geoffrey to bring up a flock of goats to browse on the mountain. At sundown, he went skipping down the mountain again with his light-footed animals. When he reached Geoffrey, he would give a shrill whistle whereupon all the owners of the goats would come out to take home the animals that belonged to them. Dede had been standing for a good 10 minutes looking about her in every direction for some sign of the children and the goats. Meanwhile, Heidi and the goat herd were climbing up by a far and roundabout way. The Peter knew many spots where all kinds of good food in the shape of shrubs and plants grew for his goats. The child, exhausted with the heat and weight of the thick clothes, panted and struggled after him, at first with some difficulty. She said nothing, but her little eyes kept watching first Peter as he sprang nimbly here and there on his bare feet, clad only in a short light breeches and then the slim leg coats that went leaping over rocks and shrubs. All at once, she sat down on the ground and began pulling off her shoes and stockings. Then she unwooed the red hot shawl and took off her frock. But there was still another to unfasten, for Dete had put the Sunday dress on over everyday one to save the trouble of carrying it. Quick as lightning, the everyday frog followed the other and now the child stood up and clad only in her light, short-sleeved undergarment, she stretched out her little bare arms with clean. Leaving all her clothes together in a tidy little heap, she went jumping and climbing up after Peter and the goats as nimbly as any of the party. Now that Heidi was able to move at her ease, she began to enter into conversation with Peter. She asked him how many goats he had, where he was going to with them, and what he had to do when he arrived there. At last, after some time, they came within view of Tete. Hardly had the latter caught sight of the little company climbing up towards her when she shrieked out, Heidi, what have you been doing? What a sight you have made of yourself. And where are your two frocks and the red wrapper? And the new shoes I bought? And the new stockings I needed for you? Everything gone? Not a thing left? What can you have been thinking of, Heidi? Where are all your clothes? The child quietly pointed to a spot below on the mountainside and answered, Down there. You good for nothing, little thing, exclaimed Tete angrily. What could have put it into your head to do that? What made you undress yourself? What do you mean by it? I don't want any clothes, said Heidi. You wretched, thoughtless child. Have you no sense in you at all? Continued Tete, scolding and lamenting. Peter, you go down and fetch them for me as quickly as you can and you shall have something nice." And she held out a bright new piece of money to him that sparkled in the sun. Peter was immediately off down the steep mountainside, taking the shortest cut and was back again so quickly with the clothes that even Tete was obliged to give them a word of praise as she handed him the promised money. Peter promptly thrust it into his pocket and his face beamed with delight. For it was not often that he was the happy possessor of such riches. You can carry the things up for me as far as uncles, as you are going the same way, went on Dete, who was preparing to continue her climb up the mountainside, which rose in steep ascent immediately behind the boat herd's hut. Peter willingly undertook to do this and followed out. After a climb of more than three quarters of an hour, they reached the top of the Ampart. Uncle
people's heart stood on the projection of the rock, exposed indeed to the winds, but where every ray of sun could rest upon it and a full view could be had of the valley beneath. Behind the hut stood three or four trees with long, thick, unlocked branches. Beyond these rose a further wall of mountain, the lower heights still overgrown in beautiful grass and grass. Against the hut, on the side looking towards the valley, uncle had put up a seat. Here he was sitting, his pipe in his mouth and his hands on his knees. Quietly looking out, when the children, the goats, and Tay suddenly clambered into the room. Heidi was at the top first. She went straight up to the old man, put out her hand, and said, Good evening, grandfather. So, so, what is the meaning of this? He asked roughly, as he gave the child an abrupt shake of the hand, and gazed at her from under his bushy eyebrows. Heidi stared steadily back at him in return with unflinching gaze. Meanwhile, Dede had come up with Peter after her. I wish you a good day, uncle, said Dede, as she walked towards him. And I've bought you Tobias and Adelaide's child. You will hardly recognize her, as you've never seen her since she was a year old. And what has a child to do with me up here? asked the old man curtly. You there, he then called out to Peter. Be off with your goats. You're none too early as it is, and take mine with you. Peter obeyed on the instant and quickly disappeared. The child is here to remain with you, Dede made answer. I have done my duty by her for these four years, and now it is time for you to do yours. That's it, is it? said the old man as he looked at her with a flash in the eye in his eyes. And when the child begins to fret and whine after you, what am I to do with her then? That's your affair, interrupted Dated. If you cannot arrange to keep her, do with her as you like. You will be answerable for the results if harm happens to her, though you have hardly need to add to the burden already on your conscience. Now, Dede was not quite easy in her own conscience about she was doing, and consequently was feeling hot and irritable, and said more than she had intended. As she uttered her last words, Uncle rose from his seat. He looked at her in a way that made her draw back a step or two. Then, flinging out his arm, he said to her in a commanding voice, Be off with you this instant, and get back as quickly as you can to the place where you came and do not let me see your face again in a hurry. Dede did not wait to be told twice. Goodbye to you then, and to you, Heidi, she called as she turned quickly away and started to descend the mountain at a running pace, which she did not slacken till she found herself safely again at Geoffrey. The End <laughs>